All right, the title of my sermon today is How to Stay Positive. How to Stay Positive. So I just thought about some practical ways and just some scriptural teachings to help you stay positive. Uh, you know, so I just reflecting, because obviously, obviously in our life, negative things happen. Right? And uh, sometimes when too many negative things happen, people can start to have a pessimistic outlook on life rather than an optimistic outlook on life. And I just sort of thought about the ways, because I tend to think of myself as a pretty positive thinking person. So I just tried to think of ways that, you know, what helped me throughout the years to keep a positive mindset. You know, always be thinking positive, thinking of the positive things rather than the negative things. And I think this may help uh, you guys, you know, uh, in terms of staying positive rather than negative. So there are six things I want to go through, and I've got them numbered so you can see how quickly I'm progressing through this sermon. Six points I want to share with you on how to stay positive. And the first one is your values. Your values. Do you have the right values? Are you negative because you are valuing the wrong thing? And when things go wrong in those areas, you're negative when really you shouldn't be negative because really those things should be of less value to you than things that should be truly of value. So we read from Philippians 4 because I just wanted to focus on this passage because we're talking about having a positive mindset, right? How to stay positive. Because negativity doesn't get you up in the morning, right? Negativity doesn't make you excel at life. And first and foremost, and most importantly, negativity is not going to make you do great things for God if you're just negative all the time. Negativity is what kills you know, families. Negativity is what kills business, right? Kills you know, whether you're a business owner or whether you have a job. But you know what negativity also kills? It kills churches as well. When people are just negative about things, oh, you know, what's the point of doing this? It doesn't make a difference anyway. I mean, people have that sort of negativity and they bring it into politics too and they just think, oh, you know, what's the point? Oh, I, I, what's the point of even voting, right? It doesn't make a difference. It's that, it's that negativity and misguidance, might I add, that leads to the sort of government that we have because unfortunately a lot of Christians have that mindset. A lot of Christians have the mindset that they will not even go out and fill out a piece of paper to change the society that they live in. It just boggles my mind that somebody will not do that in order to just, you know, affect the culture directly. And often I think of it of, you know, if there was a, if there was a, a vote, you know, where you could just outlaw abortion, Right? And all you had to do was go fill out a piece of paper and tick, yes, I want it outlawed, or no, I want to keep it legal. I mean, wouldn't you go, wouldn't you go and fill that out? I mean, would you, be, would you be so misguided to think like, no, like I am against democracy, I'm against the voting system, that I refuse to go and fill out that paper. That's what I think of people that will not go out and fill out the paper. I understand that democracy is not ideal. I understand that politics is often rigged and you know probably the banking elites have already chosen who they want to win and blah 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 and you know they're funneling their money to whatever but they can only affect the vote so far right because they can't control you they can't control what you think right so I just don't think in Australia our voting system is so rigged because it's paper voting right that, um, you know, that, it, that, that it's just pointless. How did I get on that rabbit trail? It's because the federal election just happened last night, right? That's why it's fresh on my mind. Uh, I get passionate about those things. But same thing, negativity destroys things. So I want everyone to have a positive mindset. In Philippians 4, look at what the Bible says here. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, true, things that are right, so we're talking about having the right values. So you want to have the right value. You want to actually value things that are right. Family, truth, the Bible, husband and wife, proper roles, raising children, things that are true that we get from the Bible. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. What does that mean? Things that are fair. 
right? When you talk about justice, whatsoever things are pure, as opposed to what things that are unpure, like fornication, right? Drugs, things that are dirty for the body, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, look at what it says here. Think on these things. See, this is what our mind should be consumed with. It should be consumed with good. If you find yourself as generally a negative person, or you find yourself always thinking about the negative things in life rather than the positive things in life, or what is false rather than what is true, you are not doing what the Bible commands you to do. See, as Christians, we ought to be positively thinking person, thinking about things that are right and true, not just thinking on the negative things. But notice the things we should be thinking about are characteristics, right? It doesn't say whatsoever things are shiny, right? Whatsoever things are expensive, you know, whatsoever things are new, right? Those are the not, not the things you should be thinking. Whatsoever things are fun, is that in the list? Whatsoever things are fun? Because that's what people get consumed with, right? People are thinking about that next holiday. They're thinking about their assets. They're thinking about that new gadget that they're going to get, that new toy that they're going to get, that new car that they're going to get. That's what consumes our mind. But this, what isn't, that ought not be the thing that consumes your mind. So maybe one reason why you're negative is because you're valuing the wrong things. You know, maybe you're too materialistic. Have you ever thought about that as a Christian? Maybe you're too materialistic. You know, if you're consumed with material possessions, if you think about the things you think about, if like, say 99% of what you think about, you know, because you're hearing about it in politics today, right? Everyone says, gotta own, you got to own your own home. As though, that, as though you are like less of a person. If, you, if, if at the end of your life, you don't have a home that you own, right? And, and newsflash, guys, most people don't own their home. When you have a mortgage, you don't own your home, right? You don't own that home until you pay off the mortgage, right? Because if you think you own that home, try to stop paying the mortgage and see whether you own that home, right? <laughs> you don't own the home. The bank, the real owner of the home, which is the bank, will come and get their home back because you've stopped paying off the mortgage that you borrowed. So, you know, big thing about owning your own home. You know, people are so worried. Oh, I'll never, you know, I'm going to get to the end of my life and never own my own home. What does it matter? What does it matter if you don't own your home? What does, it, does it really matter if you just rent for the rest of your life and you go to heaven not owning a home? I mean, is there, is, is, there, is there somehow more value in getting to heaven and seeing the home that you work so hard for burn up? You know? Maybe there's value in that. Like, there's value in putting all this hay on the foundation and you're just like, oh, look at that fire. You know, I'm sure you'll just feel ashamed that you wasted so much of your life building all that hay on that foundation rather than building gold, silver, and precious stones. So, you know, people get consumed about owning a home. You know, people sometimes are negative because they say like, oh, you know, I'm driving the same old bomb of a car. You've got a car. What do you need a new car for? You know, like, I don't care what my car is. I just get whatever car I can afford at the time. And then, you know, when I need to upgrade, it's usually because of family restrictions, right? That's the only reason why I upgraded my car. It's the same uh, clothing. Clothing's the same. You know, you say, Victor, why do you wear the same thing all the time? It's because I don't care. But it doesn't matter if I'm wearing the same thing all the time. I'm not dressing to impress other people. Sometimes ladies are like that, you know, they have to feel like they have to buy new clothes all the time because they don't want people to see them wearing the same clothes all the time. But does it, does it matter? I mean, why, why, why live just to impress other people? You know, if somebody else is going to say, oh, you wore that dress last week, so what? It's the clothes, it's the clothes that I have. You know, I'm not going to go spend money on new clothes just to impress you. Right? Just so you, you, I can say, oh, you've got new clothes every week. So. If you're negative on these materialistic things, one reason might be is because you're too materialistic as a Christian. You've got the wrong values, right? You need to think on things that are of true value, of character, rather than the treasures on earth. Look what Jesus says here. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, 
where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Look at this. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, if you value the wrong things, that's where your heart is going to be. So make sure your values are right. Your heart's going to be there. And you know what? You know the things that are of value, of true value? You know how much they cost? Zero. You know how much it costs to be a godly person? Zero. Why? Because a poor person can be a godly person. A rich person can be a godly person. It doesn't cost you anything to be godly. And that's why Paul can say, hey, whether he abounded or whether he abased, he could be content. Right? Because his, his material position doesn't change whether or not you can be, have the right values, right? Whether you can be godly. All right, number two is company. So we're talking about how to stay positive. Make sure you have the right values. If you're valuing the things of the world and then you're not doing well in the things of the world, you may be negative, right? But if you realize the things of God don't cost you any money, you can do it in any situation you are, you can stay positive. Right? because you've got the right values. Now, maybe one reason you've got the wrong values is because you've got the wrong, you're hanging around the wrong company. The wrong company. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Look at what the Bible says here. Be not deceived. Right? So don't be tricked. That's what it says, be not deceived. Don't be tricked. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Oftentimes we think of this as peer pressure. Right? Don't be deceived by the... What's the word? The, uh, the influence. You know, don't undervalue or underestimate. That's the word I'm looking for. Don't underestimate the influence that peer pressure has on you. And you may think like, you know, my, my friends, my family, ah, oh, you know, they're, they're not that bad, right? They'll say like, oh, you know, you, 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 my, my, you say like, my friends and family, they're not that bad. They're not rapists and murderers and drug addicts. You know, yeah, I'm, I, I'm not, I, I know that as well as evil communications. And I'm not saying, you know, all everyone's friends are murderers and rapists and just the, the bottom of the barrel. But when people say, you know, my friends and family are not that bad, Often I think, well, wait a second, I, I didn't know that your friends and family were God-fearing, committed churchgoers, pushing you to go soul winning, you know, asking you how your Bible reading's going, praying for you. Is that, is that what your family's like? Is that what your friends are like? Is this your family and friends that are not so bad, that you hang around all the time, that are rubbing off on you, and why God is slowly decreasing in your priority list, because that's what you're hearing? That's what the Bible's talking about when it says, be not deceived. These evil communications, it's not just evil communications like, hey, let's go smoke drugs or take drugs, let's go drink. It's, hey, focus on your, you spend so much time at church. You know, you spend so much time soul winning. Why are you, why are you giving up your life to do that? It's that sort of influence on you. It's that, ah, oh, you know, we're doing something on Sunday. You want to come? We're having a get-together on Sunday morning. You want to come? Ah, you go to church every week. What's skipping one week? It's that evil communications that corrupts good manners. Right? And you say, oh, but Victor, <coughs> going to church every week, soul winning every week, that's just radical. Are you kidding me, guys? Have, has Christianity in our country and in this church become such a joke that expecting a Christian to just be at church every week is radical? I mean, if you think that is radical, I don't know how you rate the apostles and how you rate the Christians throughout time who have died for their faith and you think coming to church once a week is radical? So that's why we have to change the perspective, right? Change our perspective. So values, sometimes we're not valuing the right things because we're around the wrong company. 
And sometimes we don't have the right perspective on the company we keep because we think, you know, what is lukewarm Christianity is radical Christianity. No, but then if you hang around people that think, oh, you know, going to church once every couple of months is good enough, that's going to rub off on you. And then you think going to church once a week is radical, whereas most people go to church multiple times a week. Right? So let's not become so pathetic in our Christianity that we think a bar that is set on the ground is radical. Right? <laughs> That's easy for us to, enough to jump over. So not only evil communications from people that we may keep company with, but you know, what about the brainwashing from the media and the movies that we watch? Right? Whether it's the TV programs, you know, selling us this false sense of love and romance. You know, oftentimes people are negative about their marriage because they're keeping the wrong sort of company. And, you know, it's not necessarily just their friends. Maybe they're watching the wrong type of TV programs. They're watching movies that keep selling them on this, you know, idea of love and romance that just doesn't exist. You know, it's fake. That's not a biblical type of love and romance. You know, and, you know, women and men the same. You know, a man that expects his wife to be just eternally slim and sexy is, is unrealistic. But a woman that just expects her husband to be eternally emotionally conscious, that's unrealistic as well, right? In terms of like, you know, men are men. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't strive to be these things. Like, should women strive to be attractive? Yes. Should men strive to be emotionally intelligent and emotionally conscious of their wives? Yes. Right? But see, a successful marriage is not that you just arrived and you can only have a successful marriage and be positive about your marriage if it's there. You know, a successful marriage is, you know, you just celebrate any attempt in that direction, right? And even if you fail, you love them regardless, right? So if you have that sort of mindset about your marriage, then you may be a bit negative. And if you want to stay positive, then have the right values, like I talked about the right company, the sort of messaging you allow into your life. So a lot of people are brainwashed from the stuff that they're constantly watching. Now, what's the big deal with Game of Thrones? You know, like, I was, I was at, a, I was at a, um, a, a, a soccer training with my son, and <laughs> a guy was telling me, because his wife... I was, I was trying to preach the gospel to him, right? He's starting to attend a Pentecostal church. He's starting to go and inspire on Hoxton Park Road, right? So I was sharing a bit about, you know, the problems I have. I was trying to share the gospel with him. And his wife, starting to get into Christianity, was happy that he was starting to come along with him to church, with her to church. But he said, oh, sometimes church is, I think, on a Tuesday night or something. I don't know when Game of Thrones is on. But he says, oh, he says, he told me, oh, I feel so bad because like, sometimes I don't want to go to church because he wants to stay home and watch Game of Thrones. I don't know what the big deal is. You know, what I've heard about Game of Thrones, I can't remember who posted this on Facebook. It might have been Lewis. But I, I heard Game of Thrones is just like a you know, B-grade pornography that's just being shown. And it's just like sex scenes with like, you know, dragons and ladies. And um, I mean, that, that, the, the, the ladies that wear that armor, it's so fake. You think they could fight in that armor? I mean, they just dress like that for you guys to look at them, right? So, I don't know what the big deal is about Game of Thrones. And honestly, I don't want to know. Because that's the problem with these series, right? If you're somebody that watches Game of Thrones, I understand how addictive those shows can be, right? Because they're designed that way. And that's why the trick to not being hooked on a silly show like Game of Thrones is to never start to begin with. You just got to think of Game of Thrones like smoking. Right? Like, why do, people, why do people smoke? It's because they started to smoke. Yeah. Right? And somebody offering somebody that first cigarette is like you being curious and saying, oh, I wonder what Game of Thrones is about, and watching that first episode. And once you watch that first episode, now you're hooked. Now you need to watch the next episode, and the next episode, and the next episode. So how are you going to kick that habit? You've just got to go long enough until you don't care about what's happening in the plot anymore. Right? Just don't, just don't watch it long enough and then eventually you realize, you know what? I don't know what happens in Game of Thrones and you know what? It didn't make a shred of difference to my life. And you realize, I, can, I don't need Game of Thrones. And to miss church because of Game of Thrones is the saddest thing I have ever heard 
And just like if you're trying to quit smoking, right? You don't want to hang around people that are smoking. So like we're talking about company, if you're trying to get out of wasting your time watching stupid programs like Game of Thrones, then you don't want to be hanging around people that are constantly talking about Game of Thrones, right? And making you care about the plot, making you care about who's going to sleep with the next person or break up with the next person and all that ungodly stuff. So the right company, what you listen to, family and friends, you know, are they really that bad? Look at what the Bible says here. When it says evil, you know, be not deceived, evil communication corrupts good manners. Even to the point where the Bible says, hey, if you're going to try and restore somebody, right? Because you want to you get together with them, you want to encourage them, try and get them back into church. Hey, that's a good intention, right? Like sometimes you want to get back together with your friends. I'm not saying cut your friends off completely, right? I'm just saying like, just beware of these things. But look at what the Bible says. If you want to try and get your friends back to God, back into church, you know, bring people back to the fold. Look what the Bible says here. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Look at this. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So you see there that there is an encouragement for us to reach out to try and help people, but it's also, hey, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupts good manners. So you need to take heed to yourself. Because you know what? When you try and reach out, you're also putting yourself in a situation to be influenced as well. And you need to be aware of the company that you keep. So sometimes we are negative because we keep the wrong company. So if you find that the source of your negativity is the people that you're hanging around with, you know, maybe if you're negative about your marriage, and you're always hanging around friends where they're like, yeah, well, your husband should do that. Or, you know, your wife should, you know, my wife doesn't do that. Or, you know, you've got to get yourself a zero, a hero, oh, what is it? Lose your zero, get yourself a hero. And you're hanging around those sort of people. That's going to distract, that's going to make you really negative about things, you know. And it's like that, not just in marriage, but in all sorts of areas. Number three is perspective. This one can help a lot, but this one takes a bit more faith, right? Because in, to in order to have the right perspective, in order to go through negative times, you need to have the faith to know that this life is not all there is. So when we talk about perspective, I think about 2 Corinthians 4. So we'll just read through this, and I'll give you some thoughts. But in 2 Corinthians 4, just verse 8 and 9, look what Paul says here. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed. Now how can Paul in a situation say, hey, I'm troubled but I'm not distressed. I'm perplexed but I'm not in despair. I'm persecuted but I'm not forsaken. Right? Because isn't it interesting that he's being persecuted, he's forsaken by some people, but at the same time he realizes he's not forsaken. I guess by who, right? Cast down but not destroyed. So what gave Paul the right perspective to be able in this situ these, situ these negative situations that he went through to remain positive? One of them is his perspective, right? Because when we read further down in 2 Corinthians 4, he says here, look at this. For our light affliction. Now imagine going through the things that Paul went through and being able to say that that was light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are seen are eternal All right, so there's a few things here so you can see here where he says while well, we look not at the things so that's why it's perspective it's how you see things so What's one way to stay positive? It's how you see things and having that eternal perspective. Because when it comes to negativity in your life, generally it's a loss, right? It may be a loss of, you know, financially, whether it's job or business or an investment decision. Maybe it's a loss in your health. Maybe it's a loss of freedom. You know, in some countries it's a loss of freedoms. Maybe it's a loss in sport. 
All right, so some people get negative. That, that's going back to point number one, right? Having the right values. But it's usually a loss of some sort, you know, and so in, to, to, to differing degrees on why people are negative. So what's one way to stay positive when you go through some sort of loss? It's having the right perspective. And a few thoughts here in this passage. One is, look at what Paul says here. He says, for our light affliction. One way you can stay positive through a negative time, you know, through a loss, is, is it really as bad as you think it is? Is it really, is it really as bad as you think it is? And, I mean, in, and is it bad in comparison to what? Does, does any of us in this room, can any of, of us in this room really say that we are going through something so bad that we would rather the life of somebody in like a third world country? You know, it's like people say, you know, poor people have problems and rich people have problems, but they'd, they'd rather have the rich people's problems, right, than the poor person's problems. And you know, all of us in this room, we may not be filthy rich, but according to, you know, compared to most of the people in the world, we are rich, right? So I'm not downplaying your problems. You know, I'm not saying that your problems aren't important and things like that. I'm just giving you some advice on how you can stay positive when you go through problems. And one thing you can ask yourself is, is it really that bad in light of what could be bad? You know, what, could, what, could, what, what is something that is worse that could happen that you're not going through, right? That you know other people go through or other people in the other parts of the world go through. So one is, how much worse could it be? A second thing you can think about when you go through negative times is it says here, it worketh for us. To what purpose is God even allowing this in your life? Right? So rather than going through a negative time and just thinking, oh, my life sucks. You know, this sucks and it's negative. You know, one thing that has helped me in my life is every time I go through a hard time is thinking, okay, why has God allowed this in my life? And what is he trying to teach me in this? Because you don't want to miss the lesson in your life. Because you may go through a negative time and God is allowing that negativity in your life in order to teach you something. But if you're not awake to what's going on, right? And if you're not spir spiritually in tune enough to think, man, God is actually allowing me to either go through this trial or go through this chastening to teach me something, you may miss the lesson. So to what purpose are you even going through that negativity? Because God ultimately has allowed that to happen to you, even though it may have been done by somebody else or brought upon by yourself, or it may have been caused by God. So to what purpose? And it's always to mould us into the image of Jesus Christ. It's always to make us, teach us, mould us, so don't miss the lesson in every trial. The last thing is the time frame. Whatever negativity you experience in this life, if you have the right perspective and know that there is eternity, any problem you experience in this brief vapour of a life is nothing compared to eternity, right? And that's why Paul says, you know, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, right? It cannot even be compared. So that's why perspective matters. And that's why often people struggle with the question, why does God allow suffering? Because their perspective is, this is my life, right? But if you realize, if your perspective is, this is my life, and this is eternity, your loss suddenly becomes very different. And it helps you to stay positive, at the very least, right? To overcome that, if you stay positive, then you can take the next steps in rectifying that. Let's go on to number four. Number four is, so I've got basically three things that you, you, know, you want to have the right values, the right company, the right perspective. The next three things are things that you can focus on to stay positive as opposed to focusing on the wrong thing. So number four is focus on the things that you can control rather than the things you can't control. That's one way you can stay positive. 
Because there are many things going on in life, right? And things you can control and things you can't control. If you focus on the things you can't control, you end up being a very negative person because you can't do anything about it. So don't focus on the things you can't control. Just focus on the things you can control. I heard a saying once I thought was very cool, is that you do your best and let God do the rest. All right, so that's really talking about, hey, you just do your best with what you can control and let God figure out the things you can't control. Look at what it says here in 1 Corinthians 4. This is a bit more insight into Paul's mindset when he goes through trials, when he goes through negative times. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. place. And labor, working with our own hands. Look at this, being reviled, so that's something they can't control, we bless. He can control his reaction, right? His own actions. Being persecuted, we suffer it. So you see how, you know, like people talk about being offended, right? You know, no, nobody, nobody gives, they say, they say like nobody can make you be offended. You, you have to just take offense. What do they say? You can't, nobody gives offense, you can only take offense. Why? Because you can't control what other people say, but you know what you can control? You can control how you react to what people say. You don't need to be offended. So it's this same idea of concentrating or focusing on, seeing on what you can control. You can control yourself. You can control your own actions. You can't control other people and their actions. So if you focus on other people all the time, oh, I can't believe she did this. I can't believe he did that. I can't believe she said that. Oh, if she said that, she, she knew that she, if she said that, she would make me feel like this. That's the negativity. But the positivity is you stay positive. Is hey, I don't need to let that person's words affect me like that. I don't need to let those actions or whatever is happening in the world affect me like that. It'll help you to stay positive. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. You know, when I was um, in Mexico, I, I, and you know, this is uh, one of the reasons why this point made it into this sermon. When I was in Mexico, if you didn't know the story, I actually, uh, um, for those of you who don't know the story, uh, I was in Mexico to try and get my wife's visa. Right? And back then I was young, I didn't know how all traveling worked. Me being the you know, naive, privileged Australian, I just thought you could fly to a country and go to the border and just pay a fee and then they just let you in, right? Because that's how it is for an Australian. Right? Australian, you want to travel anywhere? You go there. If you didn't have a visa, that's fine because you just apply at the border and probably the countries have some sort of agreement where you can just get a tourist visa and walk in and fly through a country. You don't even think about that sometimes when you book international flights. Well, my wife has a Mexican passport. So when I booked her flight to go through America to come back to Australia, right, I didn't realize we need to, to apply for that American visa. Otherwise, she wouldn't be able to get on that flight. And you know what? I had packed up everything. We'd, we'd moved out of our rental, sold everything. Friends took us to the airport. You know, all we had, all we owned was in two suitcases. Simon was in a, in a capsule at the time. And we got to the counter and that flight attendant said, we cannot let you on the plane. And my heart just sunk. But, you know, thank God we had good friends, took us in, gave us a place to stay while we figured out a way to, to, to apply for a different visa because she couldn't fly through America. We had to fly through Canada and come back to Australia. And I remember the family that we stayed with, you know, because you know, obviously I was, I was stressing, right? It's, and that's why, and I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm preaching this sermon, but you know, I, I need this advice as well. It's, e it's, e it's easy to teach, right? Not so easy to do, I understand. But you know, like, I, was stress I was really stressing at the time. And you know one thing he said to me? He said, you don't have to worry because if you could do something about it, you'd do it. And if you can't do anything about it, you can't do anything about it anyway. So why worry? So this is why I often think how to stay positive in rough times is you just focus on the things you can control. Because if you can't control it, why are you focusing on it anyway? You can't do anything about it, <laughs> right? So it was like I was stressing about, hey, well, you know, what if this happens and what if that happens and everything like that? And he said to me, Victor, there's, no, there's never any point worrying. 
because if you could do something about it, you could do something about it. And if you can't do anything about it, there's nothing you can do about it anyway. So why stress? Why worry? You may as well just focus on the things that you can do something about. That's number four. Number five, and I guess this goes back to number one. I mean, number one really is the, the, the uh, you know, the, the foundation of all the rest of these, right? Having the right values is going to give you the right priorities. But number five is to focus on what you have and not on what you don't have. That's one way to stay positive. Focus on what you have and not what you don't have. And you might say, oh, well, what if I've got nothing? You know, even the person that says, well, I don't have a job. I don't have a house. I don't have a car. Well, you know what? If you had nothing, you wouldn't even be here to complain about it. Why? Because you've got life. See, oftentimes we take for granted the things that we have because we're focused on the things we don't have materialistically. That we forget the things that we do have. Right? We've got life. I mean, and not even about that. I mean, before we even get onto those things, most of us in this room actually do have a lot of things that we take for granted materialistically. You know, you do have a house. You do have a car. You do have a job. But sometimes you get negative about that extra thing you didn't get. It reminds me of my children when, you know, they, we go to Kmart and they didn't get that extra Lego and it just ruins, like, now they're just, they're just so upset because they worked away from, K they had a trip to Kmart and they didn't walk away with a new toy. That's what you're like sometimes as a spiritual baby. You don't get that extra little thing and that just ruins your day, ruins your life when you forget how you've got somewhere to sleep, you've got somewhere to live, how you've got shoes on your feet, clothes on your back, you've got enough money to know where you're going to get the next meal from. Hey, you know what, you've probably got air conditioning in your home. Just things like that, right? You've got, not only that, but you've got, you know, the stuff that God has given you inherently, not materialistically, life. You know, the, the ability to see, the ability to breathe, you know, the, the, the be able to, to touch things, to feel things, to be able to walk. I mean, if you focus, if you focus on the things you had, it's hard to, it's hard to be negative because you've got too many things to be thankful for. But people, they focus on the things they don't have and that's why they're negative. So if you want to be positive, focus on the things you have, not on the things you don't have. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things, look at this, as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And you know, if you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, hopefully everybody here has put their faith completely on Jesus Christ, even if you, lo even if you lost everything, life included, you would still have salvation. Thank God for eternal security. Thank God for everlasting life. Thank God for the promise that I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I, you know, I, I, I feel sorry for the people that don't believe in eternal security. Because, you know, for, the, for them, when you're negative and you're down and you're out of church, you, don't, you not only lose everything, I mean, you can lose salvation itself. Ah, oh, not people that believe the Bible. You know, we know, hey, even if we lost everything, man, we would still be saved. Thank God for that. All right, so focus on the things you have, not on what the things you don't have. And the last thing I want to focus, the last thing I want to talk about is number six on how to stay positive is focus on others rather than yourself. See, people that are overly negative, you'll realize that they're generally focusing more on themselves, what they didn't get, how life is tough for them. And like I said, I'm not downplaying the struggles you have in your life. Because we all have struggles, right? And I'm not saying that they're not important, I'm not saying that they're, they're silly and all that sort of stuff. But what I'm saying is, generally people that are negative are more focused on themselves than focused on others. So if you wanna stay positive, have a focus on others rather than yourself. Because you know what? Your problems diminish a lot more 
when you're trying to help others with their problems, right? When your focus is on other people, you're not focused so much on the negativity happening in your own life. We ought to have this mind of service, this mind of thinking of others, and that's one way we stay positive. Philippians 2. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So it starts with love. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, look at this, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. What's this mind? This mind of thinking of others first. Which was also, let, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form, look at this, the form of a servant. That's what it means to focus on others more than yourself. And you know what? If we all had that attitude, imagine what this church would be. If we had a church of people focused on serving others rather than a church of people just focused on ourselves only. It was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And just a practical application. You know, the best way to just focus on others that I've found in my life to stay positive is soul winning. Because I find, like, it doesn't matter how down your life is and how negative your life is, when you go out soul winning, right, one is you're constantly reminded of the love God has for you. When you get to share the love of God with somebody else, you know what it does? It reminds you, man, God loves me so much. Right? Because you're trying to convince that person how much God loves them and reminds you, hey, the, the love that I'm trying to tell about, the love that I'm trying to tell this person about is the love that I have in God. Yeah. So not only that are you reminded of God's love and that keeps you positive, but number two is for a brief moment in your life, you're not worried about figuring out your own problems, right? So in regenerating your life, it's figuring out your own problems, problems at work, problems at home, problems with family, you know, it's problems, your problems that you've got to figure out. But when you go soul winning, that's not a problem for you, if you're saved, right? That's not a problem. So you, you don't have any problems that you're focusing on, and all you're focusing on is the problems of others, right? But it's the problems of others. When you go soul winning, you're thinking about others. And that's what I find, that you can, it's, sometimes it's a bit of escape from the world, and it's a, it's a chance to become positive again, because life can be so negative, can't it? Jude 22 and 23, and of some have compassion, making a difference, look at this, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. All right, so that's all I've got for you. I hope that was a blessing. How to stay positive. Just to recap, number one is make sure you have the right values. If you're valuing the wrong thing, that might be a reason why you're a negative all the time. So if you're valuing the right things, then that will help you stay positive. Number two is maybe the reason why you have the wrong values is you're keeping the wrong company. Maybe you're watching too many bad TV shows, right, and giving you the wrong perspective on life and uh, relationships and whatnot. Number three is to help you stay positive is having the right perspective. You know, is what you're going through really that bad? And how bad is it compared to eternity? You know, that, that will reduce the stress you have on that negativity if you have the right perspective on things, you have an eternal perspective. These are things you can focus on. Number four is focus on the things you can control rather than the things you can't control. You know, do your best and let God do the rest. Number five is focus on the things you have. Be grateful for what you have rather than focusing on the things you don't have. Don't be like the spoiled little child, the child that is just ungrateful for all the things that the parent does for them. It's the same for us as spiritual children. We're so ungrateful for all the things God does for us that we become negative just when we don't get one extra thing. 
So if you focus on the things that you have, the things that God has given to you, you can stay positive. And number six is focus on others rather than focus on yourself. And that'll diminish your issues and that'll also make you have a mind of service. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Um, I pray that this sermon was a blessing to the people that heard it today. Um, Lord, uh, you know, not everything is positive in our lives. And that's a good thing, Lord, because sometimes negativity makes us better people. But I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to have the right perspective on negativity and help us to stay positive, help us to overcome, help us to continue to do great works for you, help us to be grateful for the things we have and help us, Lord, to be just effective in our lives so that negativity will not hold us back. So we thank you, Lord, for advice you give us in your word. Uh, help us to stay positive and um, just pray, Lord, that this sermon was a blessing to the people here. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.